Grace and peace to you. This is Laura Sugg. You'll see me in just a moment, but we will begin with one of the pieces. again. Good morning. Let me just get my microphone set back up. So grace and peace once again to all of you who are either watching us live or will be joining us shortly or watching the video after the fact. I give you a special Greeting on behalf of Wheat Ridge Presbyterian Church. I'm the Reverend Dr. Laura Sugg. So welcome to worship on this beautiful morning actually in uh, the Denver area. And um, I will invite you if you've watched this before, some of you have already done so, but if you have a Facebook account, whether you're watching this live or after the fact, would you say a little comment? You can just say hello. That's the best way for people who are watching to see who either was here live or watched after the fact. So you don't have to say anything huge, just if you can comment and say hello, that would be wonderful. And uh, I want to thank you again for your continuing financial support of Wheat Ridge Presbyterian Church. We are still very busy. In fact, uh, some committees are, are ramping up after you know a couple of months of not sure what what was going to be happening. So um, I give thanks personally and f on behalf of the church for those donations. You can donate uh, through our church website by sending a check through the mail, whatever way works best for you. And we're grateful for that uh, financial support. Today is communion, as you could probably tell uh, from our elements here. If you haven't already, I do invite you to either pause the video if you're watching afterwards or um, right now while you're in your homes, find a little something, something like bread, something like juice or wine uh, so that you too can partake at the Lord's table because uh, all are invited and all who love Christ and want to love Christ more are invited to partake of communion. 
After this, we will have Zoom fellowship as we always, uh, well, almost always do. So uh, if you're a member of the congregation or a friend of the congregation and on our email list, you will see the links. Uh, it's the same link as uh, every Sunday for the past couple of months. And if you would like to join our email list, please go to our website, wrpres.org. Uh, it also can be found in the Facebook, uh, church Facebook page. Um, and let us know you'd like to join the news. Well, we, we're not doing a newsletter, but email list, and we would love to stay in touch with you no matter where you live. I do invite you, uh, that was just a taste of Julie Pulliam's video. Uh, all of the music is covered under one license or is public domain. And uh, also to watch uh, all of Katie's video, I'll play part of that in a little while. And then um, Linda Vallow's wonderful time with children and youth, which really is a time for all ages. We can all uh, learn something from her messages. So this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we prepare to listen to God's word and then to listen to the preached word and share communion, let's pause in silence to leave with God any burdens or mistakes, blind spots, words we regret so that unburdened by the past, we can live in the present confident of a hopeful future. Let's pray. Thank you, loving God, for forgiveness and the call to live your love and justice in the world. Amen. Brothers and sisters, friends, siblings in the Lord, have peace knowing that forgiveness comes through unburdening and the forgiveness uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Before our scripture reading, um, I wanted to set the stage because it's really my message is beginning now and then we'll read this passage and then I'll continue for a little bit. I just want to line up our other video and that's ready to go for later on. Uh, so, so many times preachers, including myself, we look at one passage in the Bible because of course it's too much to take even one book of the Bible or even a chapter of the Bible all at one time. Uh, but especially in these stories from Genesis uh, that are, tell the story of the origins of our family of faith, it's like a family history, um, if we take them too much in isolation, we forget the context of one particular character's life. So here are some reminders of who Jacob is. We're reading about Jacob like we did a couple of weeks ago when we talked about Jacob's ladder. I went ahead and left that out so everyone could see that again. So uh, again, these are the family history, the ancient stories that tell the origin of Judeo-Christian religion. So uh, you will all remember, if you had Sunday school or if you've read the Bible uh, on your own, about Abraham and Sarah, uh, God makes a covenant with Abraham and Sarah that they will indeed have a child in their old age and that that child will be uh, lead to descendants greater than the sands um, and they will have a homeland. So Isaac and Rebecca, uh, Rebecca is Isaac's wife, and uh, they continue this heritage, and they have, um, with Rebecca, Isaac has two sons, twins. Esau is older by just a couple of minutes, and Jacob was, we are told in the story, holding on to Esau's heel. So he's just seconds older, uh, younger than Esau. And uh, Jacob means hold the heel of, or it can mean one who supplants, who takes the place of. So true to his name, Jacob, with the help of his mother, tricks 
and lies to his, first his older brother, then his father, to steal first the birthright, then the blessing that in this patriarchal system that they're living in, uh, about, what, 4,000 years ago, roughly? If It's before we know what time period. It's prehistory. But anyway, so uh, Rebecca helps him, tricks uh, brother and uh, her husband out of this right, and um, Esau has the right to that as firstborn, but of course he loses it by a bad choice and by tricking. So two weeks ago, we did focus on Jacob's ladder, and that was when Jacob was running away from Esau because Esau was naturally angry that his blessing and birthright had been stolen from him. So uh, Rebecca and Isaac tell Jacob, you know what, get out of here, get away from Esau, go to this other land where we have some distant relatives and find a wife. So on the way to that uh, other land is when um, Jacob has the dream of the ladder up to the heavens. Jacob's amazed that God is present in this barren place, which is really no place of note until this happens. And you may remember he, he anoints the rock that he had the dream on and calls the place Bethel, the house of God. And last week, I mean two weeks ago, I invited everyone to look around their own lives and to anoint uh, in some sort of metaphorical or even literal way something in their home that reminded them that our home is also the house of God, uh, that it is not in one place, but is everywhere we see it. So today's reading is another traveling story, and it does relate to Esau again. Jacob is not at home where he grew up, of course, in the land of Canaan uh, with his uh, parents and brother, but it's also not where he had made this new life um, with uh, and married uh, some folks, so which I'll tell you about in a second. So fast forward from that dream 20 years, about 20 years. So um, Jacob did find a wife in that foreign land. In fact, he found two, not that he intended to marry uh, both, but their sisters, Leah, the older sister who her father tricked Jacob into marrying her, uh, and then Jacob's beloved Rachel, who is also his wife, so two wives, uh, plus some maid servants, and we won't go too much into that. But at the start of our reading today, Gen Genesis 32, verses 22 to 31, Jacob's family has grown to 11 of his eventual 12 sons, including Rachel's son, his special favorite, uh, Joseph the Dreamer, who at this point is just a little boy. He doesn't have his Technicolor dream coat or anything. So Jacob has grown rich because of God's blessing and reassurance to him at his father's expense. Uh, Jacob is crafty still, uh, but he uh, avoids his father-in-law trying to cheat him. And Jacob hears God tell him very clearly that it's time to return to his father Isaac and his home in Canaan, and God promises to be with Jacob. Uh, Jacob's nearing where his brother Esau lived, had moved away a little bit from where his parents lived, and Jacob sends presents of livestock in waves so that it's just wave after wave of gifts of livestock, the essential property of that day. And, but he still doesn't know for sure whether Esau will forgive him or kill Jacob and all of his family. So you'll hear in this first verse of our reading that to keep them safe, Jacob sends his family and goods ahead across the uh, creek or the stream, and he is alone, but he's also remembering God's promise of good. So let's pray, and then I'll read Genesis 32, 22 to 31. <clears throat> Spirit of fire, open our hearts, our minds, and hands to hear your living word 
and live its truth with your love and your justice today and evermore. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jaddok. He took them and sent them across the stream. And likewise, everything he had, Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him in the hip socket. And Jacob's hip was out of, put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day, break, day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, which means face of God, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and, let my li and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So these uh, chapters of Genesis are a kind of family history, as we talked about. It is a very patriarchal system where uh, men had huge control over everything and inheritance was based on birth order and, of course, gender. And some people may feel that it's just so distant from what we want in life, which is equality and gender uh, equality and that kind of thing, uh, that they may want to throw it out completely saying this cannot be meaningful for us today. Our lives are so different than about 4,000, 5,000 years ago. But I hope that we can, of course it's my job as a preacher, but I also as a follower of Jesus often will look at these stories that are very archaic uh, especially these stories from prehistory, uh, I try to look for what they can say to me rather than the ways it falls short from my standards of uh, modern ethics and morality. Not that those aren't important, but I try to glean what I can from a story like this. So often we imagine in our I, I don't know, if you grew up going to Sunday school uh, like I did, you may have thought, well, you know, the people in the Bible are always really holy. They always make the right choices, and they uh, are kind to people, and they're honest. Uh, but, of course, our story of Jacob, you know, one of the founders of uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, he is no saint. He is conniving, he's crafty, he lies, he tricks, he persists, uh, as Linda Vallow talked about in her lovely Time with Children and Youth. He keeps going despite the obstacles that are placed in his way, which there are obstacles. Uh, after he tricks his brother Esau and goes to this land, his soon-to-be father, well, not so soon-to-be father-in-law, uh, requires him to work for seven years before he can marry Rachel, who he's fallen in love with at first sight. And then uh, Laban tricks him and says, uh, puts Laban, uh, I mean not Laban, Leah, his daughter Leah, his older daughter Leah, and tricks um, 
Jacob into marrying Leah first, and then later he marries Rachel. So there's a lot that he goes through in that 20 years between the dream and our story today. He works very hard and he prospers uh, kind of at his father-in-law's expense only because God is uh, working with Jacob and um, preventing the tricks that Laban tries to uh, play on Jacob from working. So Jacob accumulates all this livestock and prospers and um, here he is again on a fearful journey and we know from the stories about Jacob in Genesis that he encounters God in these intense ways uh, through his life and um, first in the dream and then other places where God speaks to him to reassure him to persist and of course he's on this fearful journey again Esau again is on his mind will Esau kill him or forgive him and yet he's all alone sent the family on and this mysterious man who he comes to recognize is God uh, rather than bowing down to this and worshiping this man as either a messenger of God or God uh, rather than do that a wrestling match ensues it goes from Jacob was alone to a man came and wrestled with him all night so maybe it was God's uh, instigation but um, as he wrestles Jacob says not only tells this man his name but he also asks what is your name he wants to know who this God is uh, but he's not given an answer but he is given a blessing after he's given the limp and he's given a new name to mark this new chapter and the name Israel of course we know as the nation state but it it uh, comes from this person Jacob now named Israel which means striving with God and humans and prevailing so uh, at the very heart of our stories as people of faith especially people of the book uh, joining with our Hebrew brothers and sisters um, that we see that it's not so much Abraham was faithful Sarah was laughed when she found out she was gonna have a baby um, at such an old age and named Isaac that uh, which means uh, laughter a form of laughter Isaac uh, and Rebecca Rebecca's uh, a little conniving herself and works with Jacob to trick Isaac and his brother uh, I Isaac and Jacob's brother so it's not faithful Abraham that immediately sees the promise fulfilled but it's through this trickster Jacob then named Israel that the God of Genesis builds the people these 12 what would become the 12 tribes of Israel uh, Joseph and Benjamin and Reuben and all the tribes of Israel are named from his sons so he does get this new name after wrestling this mysterious uh, person of God but he also gets this limp so he's changed and he bears the scars in a way of this persisting and striving with and uh, with God and with humans so he walks away he's not unscathed so where can we find ourselves in this ancient story you may be a little bit like Jacob or Rebecca and a little bit of a trickster a little bit of a make it happen kind of a person perhaps you're a little more like Isaac uh, trusting um, faithful um, honest but uh, I think many of us can point to a time in our life and maybe right now this is in my mind right now we do seem to be on a fearful journey we're not quite sure uh, like Jacob you know what awaits us is it open arms of forgiveness and welcome or is it uh, an attack uh, not by God I hope but um, this journey we're on in this pandemic time uh, and a time of reckoning around 
racial injustice and a time of economic upheaval. All of this can make for a very fearful journey. So whether we are kind of a trickster or um, a goody two-shoes or everything in between, we are all on journeys and we have faced our own crossroads before this or now. And we may be wrestling with God, striving with God to understand what is going on. How can this be happening in our world if you are a loving God? I know that that thought has crossed my mind. I, um, I don't blame God for this COVID-19, as I've said before. But of course, the, the question arises, all this pain in the world, God, where are you in all of this and how can we seek you and how can we learn your name? So here we have this example of Jacob in the Bible where uh, this trickster is not only, his uh, wily ways are not only tolerated, they are rewarded. He is a progenitor of our faith. So his life is not only about these powerful, intense one moments. They are also a series of ordinary days uh, as well as these intense encounters. As I said, he persisted and persisted and persisted and we leap in the story over decades. So perhaps like you or me, uh, for sure, I have had intense moments, especially feeling God very close. I've also had times in my life when I wrestled with God, was contending with God about things going on in my life or the life of the world. But my life was really made up of the ordinary days as well. The days where maybe I didn't have those intense feelings of seeing God face to face or sensing the house of God was my own home. Uh, but those days of persistence, of dealing day to day, hopefully with faith, um, with all that comes before me, and perhaps your life is like that too. I think we often point to these intense moments, and they are important, of course, but also the moments of ordinary persistence and uh, trying to face the challenges of the day with faith and with grace are important too. So uh, again, Jacob walked away with that limp and I think each of us may be able to find ways in which, yes, the moments in our lives of intensity or even the ordinary slog of getting through life's challenges have maybe wounded us in some way but we hear from the story that that's okay too, uh, that we don't have to be uh, perfect. And our time, this time, calls for some quick-wittedness, hopefully not lying or cheating, but uh, amidst these ordinary days that we might have glimpses of Bethel, of Peniel, and that's, that those glimpses can sustain us on our journey. But the journey is one step at a time. In a little while, we will share bread for the journey. And whether we see God face to face or still long to know God's name, we will continue the journey together. Amen. I will play one of Katie's. Katie Sack and I is our music director, and this time she sat outside um, to sing the wonderful Morning Has Broken. So I'll play that. Oops, sorry. Morning has broken like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. Praise for the singing, praise for the morning, praise for them springing, fresh from the world. Sweet the rain's new fall, sunlit from heaven. 
like the first to fall on the first grass. Praise for the sweetness of the wet garden, sprung in completeness where God's feet pass. Is the sunlight, mine is the morning, born of the one light, Eden saw play. Praise with elation, praise every morning, God's recreation. Thank you so much, Katie, and I hope uh, along with me you rejoiced in hearing the birds singing along with Katie, so thank you so much. Our prayers of the people, I will highlight a few uh, concerns, mostly around the country and our world, and then uh, we will have a brief time of prayer before communion. Uh, so of course, COVID-19 continues to occupy um, a huge place in our hearts and minds. Um, globally, yesterday in a 24-hour period, there were over 300, uh, almost 300,000 cases around the world, more than ever before. And here in the United States, you probably know that July has been, unfortunately, the most deadly uh, since the outbreak began in March. So we face a terrible challenge here. And we pray for the people of Florida as a tropical storm or hurricane Isaias uh, um, approaches, or I haven't checked it this morning, it may be impacting right now, and the idea of how to find shelter and social distance during the pandemic. And similarly, we pray for the people of California and this heat wave and fires, and also dealing with this amidst the pandemic where um, testing sites have had to be shut down in Florida. Um, and it's just a very difficult situation. We also pray for Democrat and Republican lawmakers in Washington, D.C., in the Congress, uh, but also those here in Colorado who are working to find a way to extend unemployment benefits, help for both landlords and tenants so that uh, evictions will not happen during this very difficult time. So here at Wheat Ridge Presbyterian Church, we pray for Doris W. You may remember that she was uh, in a home um, and set up there very nicely. I talked to her a couple of weeks ago, but she, Doris was admitted on Friday uh, to Lutheran and has had to have surgery uh, for intestinal issues. So we pray for Doris and I hope to get an update about her condition and we'll let you all know. Uh, at least by the Wednesday email, what's going on. So as we come to God in prayer, I invite you to uh, find a place of prayer and um, open your hearts as we try to do and as we share with God uh, the joys and the concerns in our lives. Let us pray. Merciful God, this world is yours. You are a mystery and yet... You have come to us in Christ so that we know your love and your word more clearly. Many of us are no saints. We make mistakes. We um, use tactics that maybe are not as holy as they should be uh, or that we think they might be. Uh, but we know that your love is with us. Um, and we ask that that love transform us, even if it gives us a limp, uh, even if we change so much that we feel a new name is needed for this new chapter in our lives. We call you to work in our lives and open our hearts to that work of your spirit that we might ever more and ever clearly follow your will for our lives and for the life of the world, caring not only about our own needs, 
but the life of the most vulnerable. We lift before you the people so impacted by this terrible pandemic, not only here in the United States, but around the world. And we pray for researchers who are continuing to find treatments, uh, searching for treatments and vaccines, so that soon we all hope and pray the world can move towards healing and hope and restore jobs lost and especially give the health workers um, time to relax and rejuvenate after such a difficult long time. And now, God, we hold before you the prayer of our own heart. Loving God, I am recalling the needs of school administrators, teachers, staff, and students as we all in this country and elsewhere discern how to care for our children and youth and also keep them and our community and teachers and staff safe. Be with all those who are making very difficult decisions and be with all of us as we deal with the ramifications of those choices. And now as your children, we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So our communion today. This is a reminder that God's table is everywhere, especially during this pandemic. I've said it every time we celebrate communion. It is just a perfect example of how the God's table is not just in a church or in other sacred spaces. God's table is everywhere. And for everyone born, there is a place at the table and there is a place for you. And on behalf of Christ, I invite all of us to open our hearts and be fed for the journey at this table. This is not Christ's table. It's not a Presbyterian table. It's not an American table. But it's a table not only for saints and holy ones, but for all of us, whether we're sinners or supplanters, we are all welcome here. So as we travel these journeys on either smooth roads or like Jacob, wondering what lies around the corner, whether open arms or attack, as we are held in God's arms or wrestle through the night, God loves us in and through it all. And this table reminds us. So at table with his friends, Jesus uh, talked to saints, saints and sinners alike. And Jesus took bread and he blessed it, giving thanks. And then he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink you all of it, and do this in remembrance of me. Taste and see. God's bread for the journey and the cup of new life to nourish us every step of the way. Amen. You're invited to partake. Let us pray. Ever-present God, thank you for the love you show to scoundrels and prudes, to the lost and the arrogant, 
to the addicted and the overachievers, to those who hog the center and those pushed to the margins. Fed at your universal table, enable us to show your love not only in word but in deed, admitting our faults, working for reconciliation, and seeking faithfulness over success. Amen. So our benediction uh, today, I decided to use one that uh, was used by a pastor that Gordon Swanson, our beloved church member, really appreciates. So I hope maybe Gordon will find a way to hear this. The Lord be with you as you walk along your homeward road. In silent thought, in friendly talk, may you be near to God. The Lord be with you as the night enfolds your day with rest. Be God in every heart, the light in every home, the guest. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the saints, of the Holy Spirit, be with you now and evermore. Amen. I hope to see you on the Zoom Fellowship in just a moment. Grace and peace.